our senior and most respected brother, Justice Sharad Arvind Bobde, former Chief Justice of India, my very distinguished colleagues in the Supreme Court, Justice Bhushan Gavai and Justice Abhay Ok, respected former judges of the High Court and of the Supreme Court, Justice Sirpurkar is part of the audience. Justice Devendra Kumar Upadhyay, Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court. Justice Nitin Samre, Administrative Judge. Judges of the High Court. Dr. Berendra Saraf, Advocate General. Member of the Bar Council of India and members of the Bar Council of Maharashtra and Goa. Mr. Atul Pandey, President Nakur High Court Bar Association the Secretary of the High Court Bar Association, members of the association, esteemed dignitaries, including officials of the state government, members of the registry, my own Secretary General, Mr. Atul Kurekar, ladies and gentlemen. Just this morning, I was reading a beautiful article in the New York Times by Justice Stephen Breyer, about what judges of the Supreme Court do apart from disagreeing or agreeing with each other on the bench. In India, we tend to agree much more than the American Supreme Court. And the drift of the article is that despite the fact that judges express their views either in favor of what the other judge is saying or against the view so dispassionately and sometimes with a great deal of vigor, they are at heart very good friends. Justice Bobde narrated how we came to call each other Lordship at a time when the vagaries and uncertainties of the appointment process were confounding us as to whether we would at all become judges of the High Court. We decided to call each other Lordship, which we still do today. Justice Gawai, to both Justice Bobde and me, is HMJ. So even today in the Supreme Court, when we meet in the coffee lounge, I welcome him because I normally arrive a little before he arrives. I always call him HMJ Welcome. I've had a long association with both the bar and bench at Nagpur. I had the privilege of sitting here twice for over three months when I was still cutting my teeth as a young judge of the High Court. And I learned a great deal from the bar. I spent very happy months here in the company of all of you who educated me in areas of law which I was not familiar with. But even before that, I was a beneficiary of members of the bar who made this cross-migration to Mumbai. Justice Bobde's distinguished father, Bausai Bobde, and Justice Vasanti Naik's very distinguished father, Mr. B. R. Manohar. I can only tell you this, that one of the early cases which I appeared as a junior with Justice, with Mr. Bhausa Bobade, involved the withdrawal of the prosecution, which was launched against the head of the Daudi Bohra community. And the test was, what is the test to be applied for the withdrawal of a prosecution of this nature? And I learned so much, not merely about the law, but about strategizing about the law from Bauseb in that case. Bauseb was flooded with work, far more work than he could handle, particularly after he became Advocate General. And ever so often, I would get a call from him, and in his typical way, he would say, Chandrachud, you go to Madgaon and argue this matter. And I would go to Madgaon and argue that matter, because he couldn't do the matter. Speaking about B.R. Manohar, there was a case which was a very complex exim case, import and export case. Our senior, who was briefed in the High Court, names not to be taken, on every occasion that the case was listed, would say that I don't know anything about this case because it is so complex and please brief me all over again. The day before the final hearing was to start, we were told by the clerk of the senior that he is not going to accept the brief and he is returning the brief. The advocate on record was simply astounded because we had spent about eight or nine days in conference with the senior. 
So he asked me whom should we brief and I said, let's go and speak to Manor Saheb who has just come to Mumbai for some other case. So he said, I'm going to go back to my room at the Oberoi by about 12.30. Come and see me at 5 o'clock in the evening for conference. At 5.30 when we went to Mr. Manohar's room, he was completely ready with the facts and the law. He had typically his green register where he would make notes in his beautiful handwriting. And he told us at 5.30, I have three questions to ask you about this case. That's all that you need to answer. I'm ready with the case. As for the rest, I'm giving you a list of authorities. Please keep them ready in the court. Justice Gawai in his presentation spoke about how glad he is that Justice Samri has made the shift back from Mumbai to Nagpur to head this bench as the administrative judge. Of course, I support that. But equally, I do respect the fact that this cross, this cross migration is taking place between Nagpur and Mumbai. That was the tradition in which stalwarts from Nagpur came to Mumbai, established themselves as leading members of the bar in Mumbai. Likewise, lawyers from Mumbai appeared here, judges from Nagpur came and occupied important positions. I personally learned a great deal in my early years as a judge of the High Court from senior colleagues like Justice Daga, who is present in the audience with whom he we shared so many happy moments discussing not just law but life as well. I learned a great deal from members of the services, from the service judiciary who became judges of the High Court. Justice R.C. Tsavan is here. As a young member of the bar who was appointed to the judge to be a judge of the High Court at the raw age of barely 40, I knew little about the district judiciary. But we learned a great deal about the district judiciary in our contact with members of the district judiciary who came to occupy important positions of responsibility in the High Court. So I do believe that this cross-fertilization of ideas without regard to hierarchy, without regard to status, is crucial to promote the stability of our High Court as an institution. Speaking about Justice Mota, I can really spend the whole night about sharing reminiscences, but just one last reminiscence and then I'll make a brief presentation on the subject for this evening. I was appearing before a division bench which was presided over by Justice Mota in a very important case relating to a Sakhar Karkhana. The bench of Justice Mota and Justice Junjunwala was dead against us. Every time that we appeared before them, they would say that, well, there's nothing in the case. On the last date before Diwali, the matter was called out in chambers before Justice Mota, and Justice Mota turned to me and said, well, he said, counsel, would you like, would you like to take your chance before another bench? Today is the last date before the Diwali and the assignments will change as they do in Mumbai after Diwali. So would you like to go before another bench? We'll release this from Parthard. So I looked at Justice Mota and said, I said, my lords, I've argued this case to the best of my ability. I know that your lordship is completely against me. But I'm personally satisfied as a lawyer that I have said all that needs to be said in this case and your lordships has understood everything that needs to be understood in this case. So I would request you now, please close this case for judgment. I will not take much of your time on the day before Diwali, but please deliver judgment. I understand that your lordships are against me. So the two judges looked at each other, they confabulated, and they said, well, we are also tired at the end of a long term. Let this go before another bench. So please don't insist that we write the judgment in this case. So the matter was made deep -hearted. I re-argued it before another division bench and succeeded hands down with a full refund of tax. But later, Justice Mota called me to his chamber and he said, irrespective of what happened in your case before some other bench, I must tell you that when you left the chamber, you grew in our respect because you placed the dispensation of justice about above the needs of your own client. And that's what I wanted to begin by sharing with the members of the bar. 
So all of us have been beneficiaries of this great tradition of Nagpur. So this year I am delighted to be part of the centenary year celebrations of the Nagpur High Court Bar Association. On 6th of January 1940, when this magnificent High Court building was inaugurated, it was described, as Justice Bobade said, by the erstwhile Viceroy as a poem in stone. Even today in 2024, with all the advancements in technology and modern design, this building remains an architectural marvel. It is always a privilege and honor to be here. I also realize the limitations of my own mobile phone when I was trying to take a picture of the building sitting here, that the mobile phone, despite technology, cannot just capture the grandeur of the building. There are some things which you can only absorb and you cannot capture, which is so true to our tradition of meditation, reflection, introspection, and not necessarily of recording everything as we do in courts of law. The Nagpur High Court Bar Association has a unique history of being christened a High Court Bar Association much before the actual High Court was established in 1936. In 1928, almost eight years before the High Court was established, the Bar Association re renamed itself a High Court Bar Association and made fervent demands for a High Court to be set up in Nagpur. In fact, the members of the association not only advanced the demand to set up a High Court in Nagpur, but also to elevate members of the Nagpur Bar as judges of that court. The active and vibrant spirit of the association today is undoubtedly rooted in this rich and dynamic history spanning over a hundred years. The Nagpur Bar has given to the country legal stalwarts and judges who have left a deep imprint on our judiciary and the jurisprudence of our courts. Two Chief Justices of India, Justice Hidayatullah, and my own very dear friend and elder brother, Justice Sharad Bobde, are products of this illustrious bar. The Supreme Court has been enriched by the invaluable contributions of several judges from the Nagpur Bar, such as Sir Justice Sir Vivian Bose, in whose court I had the great privilege of sitting, courtroom number BB, Justice J.R. Mudhorkar, Justice A.P. Sen, with whom I would spend many, many evenings as a visiting judge in Nagpur, Justice V.S. Surpurkar, and of course, my own very dear colleague, Justice B.R. Gawai. I'm confident that the Nagpur Bar will continue to foster excellence in advocacy and also contribute to the bench by producing many more distinguished members in the future. I'm sure so many of you will be guided by the examples of those who are in your midst, in Mumbai included, and Nagpur. Sri Shri Haryanya is here. But we must also remember people who are unfortunately not with us today, like Justice Vinod Bobade, a lawyer par excellence and a human being par excellence. Bar associations at all levels in our district courts, high courts, and the Supreme Court play a significant role in democratizing the courtroom and facilitating the collaborative governance of our courts. They ensure that lawyers, both seniors and juniors, have a forum to express their concerns, suggestions, and ideas to collaborate with the government, the bench, and other stakeholders. On a day-to-day -day basis, it is the bar associations, as representatives of the lawyers, who directly engage with the court and the registry. Almost every day when I climb down from the steps of the Chief Justice's court, there would be at least two or three members of the bar association waiting to meet me. There is something so very urgent that they want me to attend to. Lawyers are central stakeholders in the functioning of our courts and active bar associations, such as the Nagpur High Court Bar Association, and they ensure that there is a constant and productive dialogue between the bar and the bench. Although many of us judges have been a part of the bar at different points in time, interactions with the associations ensure that we do not become detached from the everyday realities of our colleagues at the bar. The role of a bar association, however, must not be limited to only advancing the immediate concerns of lawyers. The role extends to a broader institutional responsibility to enhance the functioning of the judiciary 
and protect the dignity of the court. Bar associations must focus on improving the quality of advocacy at the bar and more importantly, making our courtrooms more accessible and safe for our citizens. Recently, the Supreme Court took Suomo to cognizance of an incident involving the manhandling of a senior advocate and a young lawyer in one of the district courts during a boycott called by the Bar Association not too far from Delhi. You are fortunate that these incidents are not par for the course in Nagpur. The specifics of this incident aside, it is incumbent upon the bar associations to ensure the safety of all the members of the bar when they come to practice before the court. With hybrid hearings, lawyers from across the country appear before courts in different regions. Bar associations must adopt a more accommodative and inclusive approach, ensuring safety and welcoming all the members of the bar who practice before that court. I was pleased to hear about the legal aid project called Nyaya Dut run by the Nagpur High Court Bar Association to ensure pro bono access to legal resources for persons residing in the villages in the Vidarbha region. I urge the younger members of the bar to contribute to such initiatives. It serves as an opportunity to not only use your premier education and training to secure justice to ordinary citizens, but it is also a way to sharpen your legal skills and advocacy. Similarly, the steps taken by the Naikpur High Court Bar Association to mentor and improve the skills of younger members of the bar by regularly organizing lecture series and study circles must be appreciated. My last act before I left my position as visiting, visiting judge at Nagpur to go to Mumbai was to de deliver a lecture on international law, which the bar had requested me to deliver. I must also highlight the importance of having an independent bar and, as a result, independent bar associations. The judiciary has time and again risen to the occasion to assert its independence and non-partisanship a separation of powers from the executive, the legislature, and vested political interests. We must not forget, however, that there is a close link between the independence of the judiciary and the independence of the bar. The bar as an institution is essential to preserve judicial independence, constitutional values, and the dignity of the court. In a vibrant and argumentative democracy like ours, most individuals have a political ideology or inclination. To quote Aristotle, human beings are political animals. Lawyers are no exception. However, for members of the bar, one's highest loyalty must not lie with partisan interests, but to the court and the constitution. In many ways, it is an independent bar that is a moral bulwark to protect the rule of law and constitutional governance. Judgments of our constitutional courts are the culmination of rigorous proceedings, thorough legal analysis, and a commitment to constitutional principle. But once the judgment is pronounced, it is public property. As an institution, our shoulders are broad. We stand ready to receive both praise and criticism, bouquets and brickbats, be it through journalistic pieces, political commentary, or on the social media. But as members and office bearers of bar associations, with years of training and experience, you must distinguish yourself from the lay person while reacting to judgments of the court and engaging in legal discussion. Of late, I've been very disturbed by the tendency of members of bar associations to comment on cases which are pending before the court and of commenting on judgments delivered by the court. You are first and foremost officers of the court, and the dignity and truth in our legal discourse is in your hands. As members of the bar, it is incumbent upon you to communicate the judgments of the court to the public, utilizing platforms such as opinion pieces in newspapers, media appearances, and public lectures. In this sense, the bar has the potential to act as a bridge between the court and the citizens. In fulfilling your role, the bar can effectively translate complex legal complex concepts and precedents into accessible language for the public. 
fostering a deeper understanding of our constitutional values and the true purport of our judgments. On many occasions, I have spoken about the need for representation of women in the judiciary and as members of the bar. Statistically, the number of women lawyers practicing across the country has increased manifold over the last few decades. There was a time when you would enter a high court or even the Supreme Court and only see a sea of men. Many female advocates recall a time when they were the only lawyers going through security checks for women, while long queues formed the men's security check outside the Supreme Court. This situation is radically altered today with a large number of women not only formally joining the bar, but also setting up a thriving practice. Recently, the Supreme Court designated 11 women as lawyers, as senior advocates, in one go, signaling the change in the demographic of our successful lawyers. The Nagpur Bar is no exception. Of the 3,000 members, more than 500 members are women. As the demographics are changing in the legal profession and more young women are entering the field, this number will only increase. However, even as the number of women lawyers is increasing at an unprecedented pace, this trend is not reflected in the composition of our elected bar associations or even our bar councils. When there are no formal barriers to contesting elections and the number of women lawyers is increasing, the question that arises is, why are more women not contesting and winning elections to bar associations or bar councils? This lack of representation is not unique to the Nagpur Bar Association but permeates to bar associations and bar councils across the country. A study which was conducted in 2021 revealed that only a meager 2.04% of the elected representatives in the 21 state bar councils are women. Not a single office bearer of the Bar Council of India is a woman. There is only one woman member in the Supreme Court Bar Association Executive Committee. Contesting elections for bar associations and for bar councils requires extensive networking, campaigning, and soliciting of votes, which often leads to the formation and perpetuation of an entrenched old boys club. This environment can act as a significant disincentive for women, discouraging them from participating in these elections, let alone engaging in campaigns and successfully winning them. It is not enough to remove formal barriers to women lawyers contesting elections. It is the responsibility of the existing male office bearers to not only encourage and support women lawyers who stand for election, but also make the environment conducive for them to stand a fair chance. I'm optimistic that the Nagpur Bar Association, with its glorious history of fostering social change, will take proactive measures in this direction. I also urge all the women advocates in the audience to assert their position in the Bar Association, come forward, contest elections, and hold positions of responsibility. In many ways, the city of Nagpur holds immense importance in the life of our republic and the life of one of the founders of our republic, Dr. Baba Saheb Ambedkar. It is here that Baba Saheb embraced Buddhism and his final remains are enshrined in the central dome of Diksha Bhumi Stupa. Additionally, Shantivan, housing a museum with Dr. Ambedkar's personal belongings, can be found in the nearby village of Chitsoli. This year marks not only the centenary of the Bar Association, but also a hundred years since Dr. Baba Saheb Ambedkar began his law practice. In honor of this milestone, the Supreme Court established a statue of Dr. Ambedkar, symbolizing its guiding presence as we fulfill our constitutional duties. In a sense, a little part of Nagpur is now forever a part of the Supreme Court. <laughs> Dr. Ambedkar's motivation to pursue a legal practice was rooted in the independence a legal practice provides. Legal practice was liberated 
from the feudal hierarchies of caste which he fought against and mobilized public opinion. Dr. Ambedkar believed that in colonial India, the legal profession alone allowed an individual to remain independent from the government and social forces. He valued his independence from an undemocratic colonial government and a caste-ridden society over monetary or commercial gain. This motivation to pursue law for autonomy and freedom that the profession imparts stands true even today. The ability and responsibility of a lawyer to act without fear or favor, ill will or affection must continue to guide us as members of the legal profession. In a judgment authored by Justice Vivian Bose, a former judge of the Supreme Court of India and, and an illustrious member of the Nagpur High Court Bar Association of this court, Justice Bose observed, the Constitution is not for the exclusive benefit of governments and states. It is not only for lawyers and politicians and officials and those highly placed. It also exists for the common man, for the poor and the humble, for those who have businesses at stake, for the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. Let us all remember that our constitution is an inclusive constitution. It is intended to bring together the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. So just as this building is said to be a poem in stone, Justice Vivian Bose was a poem personified in verse, as he wrote. I would conclude by saying that as you carry out your responsibilities as professionals, advocates, and officers of this constitutional court, Remember that your foremost duty lies towards ensuring justice and upholding the rights of every individual, be it the baker, the candlestick maker, last but not the least, the butcher as well. Thank you. Each of you carries a heavy mantle of excellence to uphold. I am certain that all members of the Bar Association will live up to the illustrious reputation of this historic bar embodying integrity, diligence, and excellence in your legal practice. Justice Gawai said before he ended that he is not making a long speech because he will speak tomorrow and come back during the year-long celebrations. I made a long speech, but I expect that I will also return during the year-long celebrations. Thank you. Namaskar.